author of TCS, a popular open source library for differentiable optimization. He got his PhD from UMass Amherst in 2018 under the supervision of Professor Shlomo Zilberstein. Thanks for joining us, Louis. Take it away. Thank you. All right. So thanks for having me. Uh, really excited to be here. So I'm gonna present today uh, some sample work from the from what we are doing at FAIR in robotic death service manipulation. Uh, it's a somewhat large team. Uh, with here, I think we can see some current members and former members of the team. And yeah, so I'm gonna present three papers. So one thing, I uh, usually when I talk about this to sort of general groups, uh, always start with saying, oh, you know, the manipulation is hard, the more of X paradox. Uh, I think probably this group is familiar with that. So the, the key message is that, you know, reasoning uh, uh, sort of counterintuitively seems to be easier than manipulation in robotics. So that's sort of the, the framework. So that being said, uh, there's definitely been impressive advances uh, in manipulation, but usually the settings are sort of highly constrained, right? So either like over the sensor or the manipulators are very simple, like grippers or uh, simple contact, or it's in, a, in the industrial automation where everything is like super controlled. Uh, so really the goal, uh, it's more something like a general uh, manipulator that can, uh, you know, basically achieve the level of dexterity that a person can have. So handle a general um, number of objects, different situations, complicated contact, uh, and so on. So how, how do we solve this problem? So in our team, we have sort of three, three principles. Uh, one is a thermal perception. So this means like take advantage of like different types of sensors, uh, vision, depth, uh, tactile and other kinds of sensing and how to integrate this into sort of like a coherent uh, space for control. So the other principle is a unified continuous based uh, skill model. So what this refers to is that rather than have sort of stitching together pre pre computed like let's say pre grass grass you know stages, uh, ideally a manipulator should so be like a smooth continuous uh, control and sort of uh, agent. And finally, the other principle is how to take advantage of pre training offline or in simulator and do fine tuning at deploy time in the real world. So, how to integrate the same model uh, of, of the world via a simulator, and, but also train uh, in the actual path that we're performing. So, in this talk, I'm going to focus more on the first two and not so much on the third one, but it's equally important. Uh, Okay, so I'm gonna talk about three papers. The first one is called NCF version two. It's about perceiving extrinsic contact from touch. The next one is gonna be a neural field, which is a, a slam system for object shape and post estimation uh, for in-hand manipulation tasks. And finally, I'm gonna talk about rotated, which is a, an approach to do in-hand object rotation with vision and touch inputs. Uh, so the first two are more perception and the final one has a, a control method. Uh, all right, so I'm gonna start with NCFB2. So the paper is called Perceiving Extricting Contact from Touch Improves Learning Insertion Policies. And this is the work by uh, Carolina Iguera, which is a intern in our team. And so the idea here is to, how to predict so extrinsic contact means uh, the contact that is the, the object doing with the environment. So the agent is acting on, you know, on the environment would be a, let's say manipulating some object. And this is referring not to the contact of the agent with the object, but the uh, object with the environment. Um, so, uh, let's see. I'm taking... Can we see the video? To, to okay too much <laughs> uh yeah is that just us or the people only I can see the video here in the in my laptop but not let me check with you know. um sometimes there's a button when sharing a video that says optimize for video sharing 
in the I mean in keynotes. No, it's in the Zoom. Like when you mm -hmm. go to click on share screen. I don't know. Does anyone else remember that button or have I lost me? I don't know that button. Okay, let me try like a stop share and try to share again with options. Advanced video, I guess, maybe. Optimize for video clip. Yeah. The, yeah. Except it doesn't, doesn't work. Uh, oh no. Maybe just try to reshare and let's hope for the best. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I can, I guess, describe it. <laughs> let's see how that goes. Um, okay. So, what is going on here? What is the. No, I don't see the. Did I close it? Share the folder. Yes, of course, the best word. Hooray. Okay, yes. So, so here's an example of like that that requires extrinsic contact. So let's say you're inserting a mod. Uh, in, so you use the contact with the environment to kind of align the handles properly. Uh, and similarly, like if you're putting a dish in the, in the dishwasher, uh, you can do that probably with your eyes closed just by sensing where the object is touching the environment. And, you know, like putting a book in the bookshelf. And I think at one, you don't think about this that much, but you're probably doing this like you know automatically without noticing. Like yeah, you know, contact with environment is basically a very important thing for manipulation. So in this paper, the the goal is to explicitly so rather than say like I have a bunch of tactile image inputs and I'm just going to learn a policy. The argument here is that we can try to learn explicitly where the contact happens, uh, and then pass this as an input to like, a down downstream pass. So this is based on this previous work uh, by the same. Inter, where you know the sequence of tactile images. I don't know if you're familiar with these digit sensors, which like you know you you can sense the tactile stream as a, a sequence of images that represent sort of like there's a gel and you where you press the movement of a gel represents like the tactile. So you have as an input the, the sequence of uh, tactile measurements and the poses of the n effector and a representation of the object geometry. And then you pass this to, uh, I think it's just a simple autoencoder with some uh, descriptor for the object geometry, and then you estimate contact. So in this paper, the problem is like they try to uh, sort of deploy this in the real world. It, it didn't really work that well. So in this paper, we did some improvements to these uh, methods. So the main idea is to replace so the other model was an auto progressive model where you you have pass the, the tactile inputs and then you sort of have an LST, LSTM that keeps you know, uh, has a memory of what you've seen so far um, and replace this with just no use that at all at all but just some temporal aggregation with a, a, an MLP or a transformer and then also. Uh, what is the other? The, there is a, some improvements in terms of the the control part. So that's that's sort of the main idea. So here is a, a more detailed description of this. So uh, the the simple auto color replace it with a variational auto color as well to regularize uh, better the the estimation. So the again the is the similar type of you also receive sequence of tactile images and effector poses. The description. So what changes is the, the model used to encode the tactile images and replace the auto regressive part with this transformer. Uh, yes. So this is an example of how this works in the real world. So it's the same task of trying to uh, insert a cup. Here we are not doing policy yet. What we are seeing is that qualitatively measuring if the, this model is better at predicting where contact between the object and the environment is happening. So you can see in the right is like what the tactile sensors uh, look like that that's passed to the variational autoencoder. And then the input of that along with the object uh, description goes to the transformer. And you can see that, that the, 
the prediction of where contact is happening is like that part that is uh, in a reddish color. It's much more accurate than the original model that didn't have the transformer and had the autoregressive part. So similar for a different task. So instead of the mug, it's a dishwasher towel. So now the question is like, is this just good for predicting the contact itself, or is it actually useful for manipulation, which is sort of like our end goal? So again, we use the same two tasks, and now we train policies using that as an input. So we compare these three policies. One is a simple proprioception, so it means no tactile input at all. And then there is the, the other one, which is closer to the previous work, which is just the orange color part, no transformer. And the final one is the full NCF. Uh, so we train these policies using PPO passing uh, either again like the, the directly the tactile inputs in the case in the middle, or the tactile inputs and the information about geometric process through the estimator and just pass the where the contact is happening as the input to the policy. And what we see here is that first in this is actually a real experiment. So we evaluated this both in simulation and the real world. In the real world, we did like 10 to 15 trials. Uh, and what we find out is that one, uh, our method allows the policy to finish the task faster. So meaning they, if the task is, if the task is easy and they, they can also succeed at sort of you know aligning the cup or putting the object in the dishwasher, while they all succeed, like uh, using this method allows you to basically the policy is more efficient and do it faster. Uh, in some cases though, uh, it's not only, it's not just more efficient, but also it means that the, this method is the one that can finish the task as opposed to uh, the others. So that's another example of how this uh, might help. So again, the, the sort of the main idea here is that we are explicitly predicting some sort of physical quantity uh, that, that has a meaning and passing this to a, a policy directly rather than just kind of go end to end with no sort of pre-filtering step and pass to the policy. Mm -hmm. And that, that helps a lot in terms of policy performance. Uh, a small question about, yeah. so then what data are you using to be able to train this contact detector for normal objects? So this, this is actually trained in simulation. So in, in the, in, we use ISAC GIMP, and then there is a model for tactile contact. So the- In Isaac's GIMP, is that a good model for that? Well, it's not directly from ISAGM. There is this uh, library called Tacto, which is used to model digit uh, sensors. Uh, so we use ISAGM with Tacto, and we roll out episodes and then have this other Tacto model to predict that sort of what the visual map for the sensor will look like given this contact. Okay. Yeah. So you basically get the entire state from ISAGM, pass it to Tacto, get the contacts. And then, so the and then it's an yeah, exactly. I see. Yeah, so, and, but this is only to train the, the contact prediction part. And then that, that is sort of done in advance. And there is some randomization, yeah. you know. Um, uh, one thing I didn't mention, another improvement is that in the original world, they, they were trying to predict directly the full uh, image. Here, we only predict sort of like the difference with the background, which means that that's uh, much easier. Right. So then another thing we randomized is like the background. We, we took like some sort of realistic background from and then you know, do some domain organization. Uh, so once that is trained, now we we use this in a different sort of run to train the policy. And then the policy is just PPO, with, you get like sort of your current state and then use this to predict what the image will look like and that's the input to the estimator. Mm -hmm. uh, do these models work in the pixel space, coordinate space, or is there any discretization uh, I believe it's a continuous space, so not discretization. You 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 query directly like the X Y Z where you think. I think it's a maybe SC three where you think you want to contact estimation, and it gives you the probability that that point has a contact. Right. Yeah. Like a vector field or. Yeah. I, yeah. Okay. It's 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 a neural contact field. It, okay. it kind of works like an SCS. Yes. Yes. You 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 query. I know real if you query the the given point and you get yeah, contact or not contact. And to pass this to the policy, you just sample points from the object. 
Yeah, yeah. There are definitely, I mean, some limitations because you assume the object, mm -hmm. the, the geometry is known, and it takes, I think, one particular graph. Uh, mm -hmm. and, okay. Yeah, but. And then for that library I talked about, so it gives contact or no contact. Does it also give like force direction? At that no, I think I'm not exactly sure what the inputs are, but what you can do it with that is generate sort of the. Let me think about this for a second. I think the input must be some sort of force uh, estimation. And then you, what you get is sort of like, okay, given this contact state, this is what your sensor will look like. So it, what you predict is the image that the digit sensor will produce for a given sort of contact effect. And I said, you have like a ground truth of the, okay. the force. Yeah. I, think. I think you have to have the force. Yeah, you have to have both the contact and the force. Yeah. Well, it was at least the pressure because you were showing those heat maps. So when it was darker, there must have been more contact forces detecting. So it's not binary. Exactly. But that's not predict. This, this is not predicting that. That's just taking that as an input. What this is, what this library gives you is like the prediction mm -hmm. of the, the map. The simulation of the sensor itself. The physics come from the simulator. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you. So the next work I'm going to talk about is called neural fields uh, with neural fields, and it's a visual tactile perception for in hand manipulation. So it's again the, a similar idea in terms of like being explicitly generating an estimation of some quantity. And in this case, the quantity is object pose and the H shape. So it's like a slam system for object uh, estimate, you know, object state estimation. So here is sort of like a full run example. So your, in, your input is the RGB and depth and the tactile sensor maps. And then this is passed to some pre-processing stage in, in a front end uh, system. Uh, that you know, prepares the input, and then you have a neural field optimizer that produces uh, a shape estimation and a pose estimation. So you can see at the top is sort of a in simulation of how that looks like, and at the bottom in the real robot, we are overlaying the generated mesh of the object uh, that's been estimated in real time from the rotation. And you can see the axis. So those axes are the estimated axis of the object. Uh, so that's sort of the overall system. So kind of breaking down some of the pieces, the input stream, as I mentioned, is the RGB and depth, and the, the visual, again, the uh, sensor uh, images, and also knowledge of probable proposition. So we use forward kinematics to do some of the things here. Uh, and this goes first to a front end system that preprocesses things, and passes later to a, a, a post optimizer uh, backend. So what this, uh, I'm not gonna give the full level of detail here. What I wanna say is that we pass this through a segment anything model with embodied prompts to get segmented depth. So the prompts, one thing that we can do, so if we assume that, let's say we have a policy that is rotating the object, so we assume that the object is in the middle all the time, uh, so then we can use the kinematics to sort of predict what is the center of the object, more or less. So that, that gives us a, a positive prom for detection. And we can get also negative proms, from, again, for from for kinematics by saying, okay, here are my fingers and there's probably some occlusion, so this is not an object. Uh, so with this, we can get a segmented mass for where the object is. And so that's one of the jobs of the front end to produce the segmented depth image. And then we also use a pre-trained depth transformer that it, it's kind of similar in spirit to the previous work in the sense that we take the sequence of tactile images and produce a, a model that can give you where contact patches are. And that's also pre-trained in simulation. It's kind of similar to the idea before. All of these are going to be passed to the backend part. And again, this is we to do this because we're training in simulation. We apply different augmentations to sensors, lining poles, uh, etc. Uh, so front end job is to produce segment uh, uh, depth and a, a model from tactile input to contact uh, patch. So now this is passed to a backend, and the backend is the part that actually does the, the shape and pose optimization. So this is essentially a pose neural field. 
the estimate sort of in real time produces an estimate of the full shape of the object, but also has information about what the estimated pose is. Uh, so it's, it's uh, in, in addition to the vision part, so essentially you have like a general field, uh, it's typically vision only. We have meant this with uh, touch by doing uh, the, some sort of pose optimization. And I'm going to describe it later. Uh, and so this, so this is the input. Then this goes to uh, the neural FVF. This is trained with a let's see, where is, yeah, with an SVF log. So you take your input, you pass this to the neural field model. We use them on the instant NGP model uh, reference in the slide. So this produces an estimation of like the, the mesh of the object. And then we can query because we have depth readings. We we can sample uh, rays in the cone of the camera, and then at specific points, uh, we we see the difference between what the SDF uh, is predicting, whether there is a, um, a collision, you know, like where the mesh of the object is, and where you're actually reading the depth reading is indicating, and so that's the SDF loss. And with that, we first, so this is like an iterative process where we first cross the mesh and then we, sorry, we, we learn the mesh, and then we freeze it and learn the pose. So what I'm talking about here is the mesh part. Mm -hmm. uh, so this produces an online uh, object SDF estimation. So one thing is like this is online. So what, what you know, meaning you, you run it once for a given object, a given, uh, you know, Policy, right? So, so once you're done with that run, you you throw away the, what you learned, um, and that. But you know, it, it learns very quickly. In like a you know, a couple of seconds, you already have a good estimation of what the object shape is. I think so, we, I think we have a oh, okay. so this would be more for like tool use because you need to learn the object, but it wouldn't be for like manipulating like apples or whatever in a factory. Uh, sorry, can you repeat the first part? Like, of the because you need to learn the object shape. Yeah. It would be more for like tool use. Ah, uh, exactly. Like any random object you could find. Yeah, so the ultimate goal here is that let's say you deploy a robot and you, you in a sort of totally unstructured environment. And you say, okay, I have to figure out what this is and how to use it. So it grabs it. Okay, okay, I think this is the shape. And now I'm kind of do something with that, right? Um, that's why it's uh, online. So, but I'm going to have to show some slides where if you assume that you know the objects mesh them, obviously you are much, yeah. much better at predicting where what the pose is. They can reuse them. Yeah. Uh, so okay, so in this iterative process, we once we so let's say learn let's do an update for the neural SDF, we freeze that and now update the pose. So we have a, a pose graph uh, that uses the SDF. Again, we have one cost function that is the same loss. So it's like, okay, where the mesh predicts it is compared with my depth rays are, you know, coming from the sensors. Uh, but we also add additional terms. Let's see if that's uh, explained here. Okay, I'm just gonna maybe go back to this slide later. Yes, so with other terms that in addition to the FDF block, we have some post regularization that says, okay, the post from previous step you know, should be close to the next step. Uh, in an ICP log that uh, aligns uh, the point clouds between different steps as well, the form of regularization. So with the with the shape predictor frozen, we do some post optimization. We use a, a thesis optimizer, which I mentioned in the introduction, to do uh, to solve the optimization problem that solves for the poses given the frozen mesh, and then we repeat this process over and over online. Um, so what this was showing is sort of like what the SDF loss is doing. So if you if this is your reading from RGB and depth, you might be able like if you don't if you don't have a post uh, mesh, you might be able to predict the shape correctly. But because the the SDF itself it has a post estimation, you can actually quickly align the mesh with the actual position in the fingers. Right? And if you have tactile images, you get even better data. Because now you you have also you're using the kinematics to know okay where exactly the the object is touching. So this this is what happens when you sort of combine the mesh prediction with the post optimization part. 
Uh, any any questions here before I show some results? Okay. So we we want to test this. What we did was train uh, some policy for rotating the object. And then use this policy to rotate a bunch of. So this is not part of this work. Like this, this is sort of a, a method, existing method, rotating objects in hand, and then uh, sort of generate data of like what the uh, camera system and the sensors are doing, and evaluate like the quality of the prediction. So we we actually created this data set that we're releasing uh, that has a bunch of experiments in the real world and in simulation. And in simulation, we get ground truth directly from the simulator. So, so the idea is that you have a run sort of input data, and then you can use it to say, okay, I have an estimator for shape and pose, how good it is. And then you have the ground truth, and then you can evaluate. And in the real world, because we don't have directly ground truth for the object pose, that easily what we did is augment the system with more cameras. So we have sort of like use the same pipeline, but with more sensing. Uh, and then we share that as sort of like the benchmark for for estimation, mm -hmm. and call that field site data set. Okay. Yeah. Do you, I mean, related to that, do you find that having an even more accurate like representation for the geometry is helpful? Like, how accurate does that need to be for it to work for these policies? Uh, for policy, well, the policies are actually proprioception only policies, so the policies are not part of it. This, the policies are just there to, for things to rotate. But this is actually a very good question because one thing we worked on was to try to pass this as an input to a policy, pass the estimated shape and pose. Mm -hmm. And while well, this works very well, this is like not easy to get working. At. We we spent some effort doing that, and the issue is that you still have seem to real problems in the sense that you cannot because this is online, you cannot train it. Like you say, you're doing PPO, even with one object, you record like a million trajectories. Mm -hmm. But this is an online system that learns a full model for each trajectory. So you kind of like train it on the loop uh, mm -hmm. directly like that. Uh, so we actually see, try to simulate the process of learning this, you know, alongside like PPO. Mm -hmm. And then say, okay, we learn, if, you, if we have this input with this uh, type of error, We'll use it in the policy, and then we found that there is like a simple real gap in the sense of what you think you can estimate in the simulator versus what you can actually estimate in the real world. Yeah. So then, do you find it's helpful to try and estimate stuff in the real world more accurately? Because there's some sim to real work that says, well, yeah. like having a better simulator and a more accurate model makes it worse when transferring to the real world. Yeah, yeah. Do you find that similar for these manipulation problems? So what what we found is that if you had access to accurate predict some of the accurate predictions that this is like let's say perfect point cloud or point cloud with little noise. And point cloud, what I said is that you can take the mesh to generate estimated by this and sample it and generate a point cloud, 3D point cloud, not just from your one camera. Uh, you can do much better than other policies, right? So but the the hard work is on getting the system. To match the quality that you predict in the simulator, so so there is still like room for you know improvement in terms of how do you actually deploy a system that uses this this kind of perception. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the when when we were working on this, we were more focused on the perception side. Uh, I think the other the flip side of that is uh, how would you build the system if your goal from the beginning is to do control. It's a different problem. Right? One, one thing is like the app's perception and can make it very robust, very complex. Uh, but if my goal is to learn a policy, uh, then uh, it probably makes some different design decisions in terms of what you do. So I'm confused by you said the manipulation policy, you tried passing the pose and the shape of the object, but also that you sometimes didn't. How does the manipulation policy work? If it doesn't have the input, the shape and pose of the object to rotate the object. Okay, so one, so to make a the, the policies here are just for rotating the object so that the perception system can be evaluated. Okay. So these are like proprioception only. No, oh, no. Okay. Okay. I think the question was more like if you have this, if you know that you have a system that can estimate pose and shape, if you pass that as input to a policy, does it get better? Right. And 
in sort of in simulation, you can see that it, in principle it's going to get way better. Like if you can pass only object faults, the policies are like you know very good, very good. Uh, but the problem is that in the real world you have all sorts of calibration systems. Uh, you know your mesh prediction is noisy as well at the beginning, so you have all sorts of like sync to real issues that in addition are your regular sync to real issues. So there's still work for this thing to be sort of like production ready for policy use. Do you guys have experiments with like objects that have symmetries? Um, I guess the Rubik's cube. Yeah. You, you can use the color to kind of figure out the pose, but imagine you have a cube that doesn't have any color. Is that would that work as well? I think. Uh, hey, the bell pepper has like a rotation. Symmetry. Yeah, but I think that it's like not there. Are, if I remember correctly, we don't have any objects that are like completely mm -hmm. symmetrical, like a sphere. Like we have a tennis ball, but it has the right, right, mm -hmm. and. If that's particular for the front end system it takes care of segmenting and processing. I think there is some, it uses like key point matching. Okay. And it has some sort of restrictions in terms of the kind of. Are you symmetry? imagining it would be hard because of the symmetry or easy because of the symmetry? Um, thought it would be harder with the oh. symmetry. It's it's harder, okay. at least the post estimation part is harder. But the ICP should, if you're not rotating it really fast. ICP will probably keep up, keep up with it. Yeah. But I think there is an axis alignment thing when you have like too many symmetries. Uh, okay. Then the post estimation is with respect to some sort of uh, or like, yeah, it's hard to, yeah, you can flip it and then you, that's, yeah, you could flip it. Yeah. So I think that part is like the harder part. Not, not some of the mesh part is like it's going to predict that. Mm -hmm. So this is fine because let's say you have a hammer. If you have, uh, like, you're trying to create the rotation, rotation handle angle, but you know, I was, you're looking at this side, this side, it's the same, yes. so you get confused, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Good. So, are you, are you talking about the, the mesh part? The... Uh, no, I mean, symmetry is making it harder. Yeah. Right? Because, like, you're trying to predict a continuous quantity, but then you, you, you notice that it doesn't look any different in certain yeah. poses, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. So, so, no, I mean, there are definitely some limitations in terms yeah. of, but, I think for the data set generation and evaluation part, there were also some choices being made about like where the axis start, like the assume that the initial uh, pose is aligned, some sort of canonical mm -hmm. pose, and then do you do everything with respect to that? Even for humans, there's famous optical illusions, like the little bit down. And it looks like you're. Yeah, you can't see, you can't know which way it's facing or which way it's rotating. Exactly. <laughs> The hard ah oh, so okay. the problem yeah um, okay so let's see how much time you said uh, what time it is oh uh we got fifteen minutes yeah okay maybe I go quickly here I, so because there's one more paper so one thing I want to show here is that adding touch improves shape estimation over vision so you can see the four image there is this like cube that that part is the back the back Right, when you have a camera, it's occluded by the fingers. The, there is no good estimation of what the backside is, but if you have tactile sensors, it kind of learns to feel that better because you are sort of complementing what the vision system can see. Um, so that's one takeaway. Uh, and you know, sort of numerically evaluate this claim also, showing that adding touch, which is the yellow, improves the, we have a shape, sorry, shape score is like the, uh, shape metric, the F score uh, of the reconstructions, uh, adding touches makes it higher, and as well as the post error goes low. In the real world, we you have an experiment where you see how how often it, it gets an average post error greater than one centimeter, and if you add in touch, it only happens occasionally. Uh, yeah, it just improves uh, performance. Uh, so. What happens if you know the shape? So then in this case, things are, are much better. So now you the pose error reduced to two millimeter. Uh, and, and the problem is easier, right? You assume the shape is known. So really what, what you only have to do is run the pose optimizer. So when you sample points for the SDF uh, cost, you know, you you basically have perfect and uh, prediction. So this is an intuitive result, but I guess validates that the system kind of works like you expect. Um, and touch only if you remove the camera and do touch only that's not good so you need both 
uh, because the camera adds context that the touch sensor doesn't. Um, yeah, so in summary, it's, it's a multimodal perception stack for in-hand manipulation. So I think the takeaway here is that you can you can do very impressive you know estimation of of, of your pose. Uh, and we know from simulator that this kind of input uh, sort of improves policy performance, but then I will say the next part of the work is like how to actually get this in a way that you know can be combined with a policy more effectively. Uh, and there are like sort of different avenues for this. Like, it's like, can you find a way to train this together? Because right now the pipeline will be, you know, you have this model, pretend a policy that assumes this model is perfect or very you know, low noise. And use it. I think sort of a more end-to-end -end approach will be beneficial. Uh, and then there are other you know, questions about improvements itself to the, the system in terms of sort of higher error, reducing sort of the, the outlier error, which also mess up the policy uh, very quickly. All right. So I'm just going to move on quickly to the last one. So the last work is. Um, just about policy, so there is no perception here. This was done by Hao Sifi, who is an intern. Well, he just he finished the internship recently. Uh, he was an intern with us. And here is like how to do rotation with vision and touch for multiple axes of rotation. Uh, so I'm going to go very quickly because we're short on time. But essentially, you can do multiple axes of rotation. You can handle a variety of objects. And the inputs here are depth and uh, contact uh, sensing. So I'm going to give more details in data size. So this is kind of how it works. So you, it's just rotating objects in different axes. So you know, like this, like this, all three axes of rotation and, direct, and the two directions for each. Uh, it's, you train a separate policy for each, for each axis. So you train a policy for x, I, uh, z axis in one direction or the other direction and so on. I think he did some recent work, recent combining, so how to achieve like target orientation of the object combining multiple of these policies. Um, Why did you need to separate the policies for each axis? So I think it works. Uh, like if you were trying one to do all axis rotation, you can train it, but it, it, it's not as effective. I think it's harder to. Okay. So, okay. I think for all experiments in this paper. One axis for each for each ball. Mm -hmm. um, but the, nothing changes. Like there are some subtle differences, maybe in terms of rewards and in, in some of the inputs. But I think the pipeline is the same. If you want wanted to run all the axes and things. Mm -hmm. um, so this is based on the rapid motor adaptation and paradigm. I don't know if like, you're familiar with that, but it's, it's basically you might you have privileged information. Uh, in, from a simulator, you pretend a policy using sort of Oracle access to that information, and that gives that determines sort of the behavior part, and then that that forms that works as your teacher. And then in a second stage, what you learn is a, a policy that instead of going from privileged information goes from the actual observations that you will have on the robot and try to predict what the other policy will do. So in in this in particular in this case. This comes in the form of predicting this encoded and string for some reason I the mouse point there. Uh, the encoded extrinsics in the middle of the top part, which is an encoding of sort of like all the privileged information that the stage one was using. So in the second stage, you are trying to predict that encoding, but the control policy is fixed. So the first part is learned with PPO. The second part is, is just a supervised learning problem. So what that means is that you can use like a first, your model can be more complex because you are not now doing RL, you're doing supervised learning. Uh, and then this means that you first learns much faster. It just makes the learning problem easier. So you are sort of delegating the, the behavior part to a policy that has more information. And then the other one just have to match uh, that prediction in a, in a simplified learning problem. Yes. Um, when you do RMA, like the encoded extrinsics, have to not be the same as the privileged information. I think they showed that if you just predict the true privileged information, it kind of doesn't work as well. Do you have an, like an insight for why that is? Or? 
You mean like you, instead of using directly the privileged information? Yeah, like why do you need the privilege encoder, basically? Like why instead not, of going directly to to the or like why not regress the visual effects file transformer directly to RT element of XO3, object mesh and physics parameters? Oh okay, I see that. My intuition for that is that that problem would be harder. I think here you're producing sort of a lower dimensional space that kind of captures like all the mm -hmm. regularities in the system and specifically in a way that lets you achieve control. Really. So really what you're trying to match is like, what is the important part of all this space that lets me do control? Right. Uh, instead, if you try to directly predict the, everything, you are like trying to solve both problems right. at the same time. But you do lose like interpretability for the yeah. latent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Um, I actually, one problem, I, I one thing I don't like about this method is that the Oracle policy has Acts perfect information access. Yeah. So it will never learn something that requires you to gather more information. Yeah. Uh, so the part is like solved because exactly. So project. but then when you actually the policy that you're gonna put on the robot is the other one. Yeah. Uh, what happens is that if you don't very quickly, you don't, if you're not rapid enough, you you you're in yeah. you know screw <laughs> basically. So, so as soon as you go slightly out of this region, then you don't have access to the privileged information so exactly so in the original work this was for like 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 a uh, robots and you know i think like if you stumble it away maybe you know falls out of bounds but it doesn't here it's like it sometimes yeah. things awkward because if you're slightly off the object falls you're no, it's not yeah, like yeah. you're done uh, so but i like the question you're also kind of asking like is the representation space for Z? Like, will the agent be more robust in that space than it will be in the original mm -hmm. data space? Yeah, I guess that's part of my question. Like, is it worth it to cut down to a smaller space because you lose so much information yeah. and you lose interpretability? I think it is. Okay. Uh, but yeah, my yeah, a lot of people use it, aren't they? Yeah, 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 yeah. it's a good method. But yeah. we, we are investigating other ways to do this because, you know, so some people are also not there. They're, there are some arguments about the encoder going out of distribution faster also and deploy time. So, mm -hmm. you know, it kind of works, but yeah, better, probably better things to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so I already talked about this part. So one one thing here is what what is the actual input to the second part? Well, for the first part, we, we, we want to show that shape information is useful. So here we pass all point clouds directly as part of the privileged uh, inputs. It's a pre process with a, a small point n. And, and then what is the corresponding thing for the second stage? So here we don't assume that we have point, point cloud predictions. Instead, we use a depth images. So instead of using RGB, the argument is that the depth is, has less uh, seem to real issues, so we use segmented depth as input to the policy. Uh, and we also use tactile information. But again, we don't have a good way to simulate this tactile simulator I talked about in the first uh, paper. It, it, it doesn't work on GPU. It's like it has a lot of like complicated things to train. So instead of that, uh, what we did was to use a binarized contact so discretize contact into some quantiles of, you know, there's contact in this location, this location, this location, and pass that as input to the policy. And that kind of translates more easily to the real robot. Uh, okay. So the experiment show one is that if you have the HORA is like similar previous precursor to this work where there is no shape or touch information. So the, what this is showing that the Oracle that has shape and touch is a much better than if you didn't have it. Uh, so it just kind of raise performance a lot. Uh, in the bottom row without shape, it's like same, but you remove the point cloud, just keep the touch, and you also see that having access to the point cloud uh, just makes things way better. So this is now on the uh, stage two policy, not on the Oracle. So in this case, we see that adding visual improves over proprioception, adding touch improves over post proprioception, and adding both things makes things much better. It's like close performance to the order. Um, and here are like other metrics and similar takeaways. Uh, so here is a similar visualization where it says stage one, how it improves if we add the point clouds 
versus without improvement, and we can see that in all cases, it's more than 30% better than if you have this input and similar finding for the stage two that consumes the vision, the segmented image, not the point cloud. Yeah. So again, adding vision just makes things better. The question is, what kind of vision do you want to add that you can deploy more easily to the robot? Uh, and we can see that it also handles out of distribution shapes, so shapes that were not in the set of objects you train with. Uh, and it's more robust if you are visual tactile, because you now can you know, get some sort of sense of the shape. If you only do proprioception, it's much worse. Uh, and here it shows that you can predict the, actually, you, after you train the policy from the encoder, you can actually get the shape if you train a decoder with this frozen. Um, so it's learning some sort of shape representation implicitly. This is in contrast to the previous work that are doing explicit uh, shape learning. Uh, okay, I think the next are just kind of repeating the same key ideas. So I think in the interest of time, I'm just gonna stop here and sort of open room for more questions, if there are any. This is sort of a summary uh, uh, of what I talked here and again, uh, the team uh, I'm speaking on behalf. Okay. Thank you. Okay, questions. I had a couple questions. One was, and I'm not sure if you're you remember this example, but there was one object or maybe two objects in the last project where it showed them being rotated, and they are not rigid objects. One had like a little few floppy strands of something. Okay. And my main question was um, like, what do you think are the main obstacles to extending this? Could you apply something similar to deformable objects? It doesn't have to be something so extreme as like a t-shirt, but maybe something that's not completely rigid like a, a dice or a, you know, an so app or whatever. Watch toy. Yeah, yeah, maybe like a like a beanie baby or some, you know, it's a little bit. The food is a good example. Or food, yeah, yeah, or something wrapped in you know foil that when you when you grasp it, you yeah. will deform it just through grasping. Yeah, uh, I think let me think for a bit. The difficult, I think, the difficult part of that might be the sort of is a, if the neural field that predicts the mesh. Can sort of recover like once you start right. converge to some sort of shape for the yeah and then all object. of a sudden you rotate and the thing flops over and you're yeah. like okay what uh, okay. I I can't really discuss I think like I don't think it will work in the current setting and I can't like offer intuition for what because I, I just, that's really not my cup of tea but I think if you had like a slow deformation like you have some object uh, slowly you might be able to. To sort of the, the mesh is adapting to what right there's speed. like some maximum speed <laughs> yeah can. exactly it's not going to instantly respond okay. and i think right now that would be hard mm -hmm. i had a second question which was how important do you think the specific tactile sensors are because there's lots of types that could be chosen you have one which is nice because the output is an image but you could have other ones where the output's not an image or other things Obviously, you only have one hardware setup, but like yeah. intuitively, do you think, oh yeah, uh, you know these fingertip sensors, like this is sufficient, or yeah. like what you're saying, like if the thing falls out of your grasp, or I can imagine one of the reasons it doesn't work so well with touch only is that you only have the fingertip. Like if you, you know, people have a sense all yeah. over their their palm, they can, you know, in the dark manipulate much right. more complicated shapes. So I guess the question is pretty similar. Like, suppose you had a better or different haptic sensor. Do you think that fundamentally changes how you should architect these types of pipelines? Or do you think, oh, it's pretty much the same. You just, you find a 2D representation of that thing and then- No, no, I think it changes a lot. Like, okay. okay. I, I'm more focused on the control part of, of the, the pipeline than the perception. So. From my point of view, the best sensor that you can have is the one that you can train your policies for. <laughs> you know, so like these 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 sensors are, are very you know can do sort of very fine grained touch, but it's not easy to train in simulation for that. Uh, so if you are if you have some sort of 
policy training in the real world, let's say you're doing some form of imitation or fine tuning or, or something where you can consume directly the sensor output and sort of update your policy based on that observation. Uh, I think it's worth to have like the most accurate sensor that you can get. If you're sort of like sync to real setting, yeah, I, I've seen many work where they say, ah, we, are, we have this sensor, but we are not going to use it. What we're going to do is like binary search and because that's easier for sync to real. Uh, so you kind of pay the price of having less sensing, but it's actually easier to train a policy for that. Mm. And in this last work, instead of using the full sensor, even though we had it, we right. did like the quantized uh, sensing for the same same reason. Um, so I would say that it's not by default best to have the best sensor. I think it's more important that you sort of your perception and planning are sort of in in sync. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I think there was a question here. Yeah, I yeah. Uh, in the RMA part, um, you're basically doing MLE for the parameters. Like you're you're taking the best estimate and just giving it point wise to the model to the control policy for the second. So how in the learning part, learning the the phase two, the phase two, yes. Um, do you think perhaps you could transfer better to like formable objects and other such like slightly other than distribution stuff by giving a distributional estimate to the in phase two? That's interesting. Uh, yeah. It's possible. I'm not not sure. Um, okay. I will have to think about it. So, what? Why? For, why exactly for the formal object? You mean like because this doesn't require that because it's like easier. Well, for example, so, if you have the like the sandwich wrapped in foil like this, and you know, if I grasp it, I'm like a gaussian away from the point wise is the right. you know but other cases could be similar yeah okay that's a good point i think the the, the formal object is actually maybe even harder as even for the first stage already yeah. so i think i i see your point when, but when you say the formal object my mind went to like how do we even simulate it in the first yeah, yeah. yeah okay okay uh, I think, yes. yeah. how do you deal with early stages of training where the robot might uh, not have a sufficient idea of a shape to not crush it or drop it huh oh well i mean the the policy that we use with always pre-training simulation and then oh, I see. and then deploy and for the ones where we're estimating object shape and this is kind of what i talked in the earlier so, question so do you if you kind of uh, straight out the simulation of the uh, get a good enough policy uh, to not get a lot of drops? Oh, the sync to real is a hard hard problem. No matter what, there's a lot of you know effort in terms of like okay, finding the right uh, see the right sort of simulation parameters. Uh, uh, but you know, with with some effort, you can train the policy and deploy, and it kind of works as you would expect. Uh, at least with the, the the last work I showed, the one where we tried to consume, let's say, the shape estimation that was very hard precisely for similar reasons. So you cannot get like the shape estimation very accurate very quickly. So the policy is like, I don't know what to do right now. So we try something needs to uh, allow the object, the policy to sort of fall back to ignoring the vision part early or things like this. But so far, we feel it's still work in progress uh, to use it. I have a follow-up question yeah. for that. So um, I'm just at a high level given this work. Do you think for grasping unseen objects and like pick up and place type tasks for rigid objects that are unseen, do you think sim to real, like simulations are advanced enough now that with some clever engineering and some domain randomization, you could do the sim to real transfer for just like rigid objects, just grasping and placing, not rotating or anything like that? Or do you think that's still not feasible? No, I think I think that is more doable problem. I think. Okay. Uh, I mean, Amazon has like a picking challenge. Mm -hmm. I think they've actually stopped doing it, but for a while, that was exactly what mm -hmm. it was. You were given some things to design your system on, and then you were given hundreds of new objects, and you had to exactly the mm -hmm. was picking and placing, and yeah, and you had mm -hmm. people all, like they're getting like ninety percent. Yeah, people were doing really well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The winners were doing that. the. Seminarios are pretty decent at the vision part, and like you know, so, so you can like train free grass. Uh, and okay. you guys used Isaac Jim and Isaac Sim, yeah, for everything. So 
it's really the contact dynamics where things yeah. start getting very confusing and they seem to be real. Um, and that, that that's more for task like rotation, right? right? Reorientation. In um, NCF v2, you guys have a lot of cool kind of insertion experiments. Um, but are people using like those in extrinsic contact estimates for tool use as well? I feel like we're using tools that kind of that kind of extrinsic contact estimation to be kind of yeah. helpful. That's the whole reason we use tools, right? It's kind of to interact with things. With yeah. Them. I think, I mean, there are there are three different like, interns working on different aspects of these things. Some people are doing like, key yeah. insertion. Key insertion. Yeah. Like, something with a screwdriver. And, but I don't think we explore specifically for that method. Okay. Um, and we have like other sensing modalities also. So not necessarily just for like, touch sensor. But you're talking about estimating the shape of the object or something that the tool is touching, not the shape of the tool. No, I mean, like, it, Estimating contacts with the tools, so between the environment and the tools or other objects in the tool. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Like if you are, let's say you blindfold uh, trying to put a key, right? Then you yeah. can use the, the touch to mm -hmm. see if the key yeah. is touching or not. Yeah. I think for like, you know, there are a lot of tabletop settings where you have like four cameras looking at the scene and that things work pretty well, but like for mobile robots, being able to infer more information from like onboard sensors, like that sort of stuff. I don't know. That sounds super interesting. Oh. Probably. Yeah, there's some thing if you're interested in this topic. I think there's work on like a NASA Robonaut too, where some people from UMass were I think it was Lee was oh. working on like basically bolt tightening or uh filter cleaning. And so he okay. was using like vision, but also you had to reason about and I'm not sure how much he reasoned about it, like how explicitly. Right. I don't think it was this explicit, but You'd have to reason about like my tool is a making contact with the vent where I need to mm -hmm. clean it, or it might you know, or my properly like set so I can turn the bolt to tighten it or loosen it. So people, yeah, I mean, definitely people are out there working on it. That's like five or six years old for sure, but I don't know if there's been follow up on. Okay. But one thing that made me think about you know like I've seen. A lot of recent work where I'm doing some planning in the high level planning in the sense that okay, I have the policy and I wanted to move there, go to the microwave, do this, reach this. And you can use like LLMs, yeah. that, that, you know, and you can do like very sort of sophisticated planning, uh, learning uh, based. But then it's like the, the tiny little details about the, the and you know, like how to put the key in the air or like how to, those are the most annoying ones, yeah. right? Like, yeah. And that's kind of like our team is like focused on that that that, that aspect. I, I it's like tangentially related to what you're saying, but made me think of, of yeah, that. yeah. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah. I have a bunch of questions.